Don Gilmore is one of Canada's most okay. accomplished writers. He is the author of the best-selling, award-winning two-volume, Canada, A People's History, and his journalism on suicide has earned him both a National Newspaper Award and a National Magazine Award. Gilmore's other books include the novels Canada, Mount Pleasant, and Long Change, which were published to critical acclaim, and nine books for children, two of which were nominated for the Governor General's Literary Award. He lives in Toronto with his wife and two children. We're in Ottawa to celebrate... Uh, among other things, to celebrate To the River, a memoir that he has written about his brother's uh, suicide, which has just won the Governor General's Award for Nonfiction. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Oh, thank you. Let's start off with uh, Rilke, who you quote at the beginning of the book. Right. We are, above all, eternal spectators looking upon never from the place itself. We are the essence of it. We construct it. It falls apart. We reconstruct it and fall apart ourselves. And I'm taken to page 93 of the book where you say, in conversation I felt like I was both talking and watching a scene unfold from above. Why did you use that quote? You know, that quote struck me because I thought it, in a way, there's something about how there's a sort of rootlessness, you know, uh, now in, in modern society. We're so dispersed geographically, families as a rule. And uh, the idea that we're trying to recreate, you know, a, a place or a, a home and how sometimes that falls apart. And in the case of my brother, the way that he fell apart himself. And I, he, you know, when he went up to live in Whitehorse, I mentioned the fact that you know he had like a almost a fear of the cold and um, the idea that he would go to one of the coldest places in the country it just seemed so curious and yet he did sort of find this home there despite the fact that he never really fit into that you know climate um, but he found this home and then it you know he built this home and it collapsed basically on him. Do you think he was purposefully trying to get away from his family? I think when he moved up there, he, you know, he wanted some distance, I think, at that time. And um, when we saw him, which would be, you know, sometimes two or three years would go by before we would have a family reunion. And it was always great to see him. But I think, you know, there's, there's certain times when I think people want to leave the home. Sometimes it's usually it's when it's younger, you're, you know, 18, just want to get out of your parents' house. And uh, in this case, I think it was a bit different because I'd already moved away and my sister was away. So he, w he wasn't kind of um, rebelling, but I think he did uh, want this distance. And I think there was a, a sort of big fish, smaller pond sort of thing going on as well. Yeah. Perhaps I can get you to read. Uh, this is in italics right at the beginning of the book, too. It's, it's just a short paragraph. Sure. The air is cold, but the sleeping pills have made you heavy and dull, and you don't feel it. You're out of cigarettes. It snowed last night, a light dusting. There is ice on the river, but the center is open, the current sluggish. You take off your hat and gently place it on the ground. The sun is already behind the hills in early afternoon, darkness closing in the way it does this far north in December. The distance to the open water is shorter than you think and you stare at the river for five minutes. Was it 15? The surface dark and changeable. There are no thoughts left, only a faint melody. You take one more step, and the river carries you away. No, that's a very poetic description of how he died, or at least how you think he died. Yeah, and that's one of the things that, you know, I came back to so often was that moment, you know, uh, standing there at the river. Was there was he resolved completely, or was there doubt? You know, what goes on in that instant? Yeah, and, and well, I want to go back to the very, you know, the beginning of the book and, and to trace through it. Uh, that's one of the things that just uh, that really haunts the people that survive is is what on earth went through their head at the time? Were they sort of momentarily sick? Did they become severely depressed in the weeks prior? Why did they do it? 
Yeah, and I think, you know, there's um, the people that I spoke to almost uniformly said in those last few days, in the last week when they'd seen him, uh, that he seemed extremely upbeat. And I gather this isn't unusual, that, that what happens, and you see it in, um, you know, the diaries and journals of people who uh, took their lives, and there'll be these sort of morbid images, and then suddenly everything becomes sort of much lighter, and that's the moment when they've made the concrete decision, and so that they, they feel this burden's been lifted. And I think, I suspect that's what happened with him, and so he made the decision maybe a couple of weeks before he got to the edge of the river, but I still wonder, you know, you you have those people who it's premeditated, they do all that thinking and planning, they maybe have a day, mm -hmm. but there still is that moment when it happens and you think, you know, is there any doubt at this point and what goes through their head at that, that moment? Yeah, I mean, there's a sense of resolution, but there's also this, it's kind of an impulsiveness too, isn't it? Yeah, and I think, you know, there is a, there's a, a website that was created by McMaster University in, in conjunction with a Hamilton hospital, and it, it allowed people who had either attempted suicide and failed or had decided to do it and then, would it, for whatever reason, pulled away at the brink. And they send in anonymously their thoughts about this, and you read these kind of raw documents. And there was a chilling one from a woman who said, um, and you, you don't have any description, you don't know who's writing, so you don't get a setup of this is a you know 88 year old woman or a 12 year old guy or something. So there's a woman writing and she says that she first attempted suicide when she was 10 by trying to take an overdose of iodine. And then, then it turns out she lost a husband in the Second World War who was a pilot, so you, now you, we know, you know roughly the age. And, and then, but she met another guy and she had a family, but she made another attempt and it stayed with her and she was going to do it again in her 60s. She was going to jump off a bridge on, into, uh, onto a highway and then decided against it. And then she carried pills with her all the time. And then she, at the end, she writes, um, it's been a really good life. I've had a good family. I'm so glad that I didn't take my own life, but I still might do it. And in that one kind of testimonial, you see all this sort of illogic of suicide. You know, she's, it's been this kind of companion for her. And even though she's glad she didn't do it, she still might. And it's, it's mysterious. In the book, you uh, go back to your childhood with uh, David, your brother. Uh, it sounds uh, to me like it was uh, it was a pretty a pretty idyllic uh, childhood. But you do suggest here that our shared bedroom and forced proximity produced ongoing arguments over everything. And I just wonder if you feel guilty about having been a jerk to him. Um, you know, to some degree, yeah. I mean, I think it was kind of. It wasn't an unusual relationship in terms, especially in that time, and um, and because our interests were so divergent, you know. Mm -hmm. So I played sports and he didn't, and he had this musical gift and I was hopeless, and we kind of went off in these opposite directions. So it wasn't, in a way, it wasn't um, all that antagonistic. It was just sort of mutually exclusive, I guess, in, yeah. a, in a way. And I mean, there's other brothers in the neighborhood who I think were much who would fight more, but were actually you know, closer in a way because they did the same things and they would have these physical confrontations, but we never had that kind of thing. You say uh, our lovely Steinway piano became a refuge for him when other endeavors failed him, like sports. He was a natural musician versus uh, being a natural athlete, like uh, in many ways you were. It's interesting that uh, the music teacher that you both had said he was gifted and should go on to another teacher and you're not worth worth uh, wasting uh, wasting money on <laughs> yeah and it was it, it's true um and it was a source of it's not that i wanted to be a pianist you know mm. i didn't really care but the fact that you go into these lessons and you know i'm struggling with each note and i can hear him when he goes in after me and he's just zipping through the stuff mm. like mozart and so it was very frustrating and um Interestingly, you know, when I was an adult, when we were both adults, he did teach me how to play the guitar. And um, even though you didn't see him that much, no. And he, because he had 
he had all kinds of guitars, but he also had recording equipment and everything. So he actually recorded, I wrote a terrible song that he then recorded me singing and, um, you know, gave me tips on how to do this. And I mean, I never got past sort of the camp counselor level with the guitar, but um, he was the one who did teach me how to do it. Yeah, I know you were pretty well, pretty envious of him. Uh, throughout the book that comes through and I, I wonder if that's because that enabled him to get more girls than you. Well it certainly was, uh, he certainly used it um, uh, in that way and it was, you know, he was a very attractive personality and that talent I think also uh, is attractive and you know a public talent I think is more attractive than any private talent basically. If you see someone up on a stage yeah, yeah. you know you can, you're drawn there because the whole crowd is drawn but it's different than reading a book. You get kind of, you know, the odd nice email from someone and you have no idea who it is, but it's not like playing to a crowd. Yeah, the adulation, I guess. Yeah. And he was social social, and you were shy. Yeah, and I, and that actually, we were very complimentary in that sense because then I could use him to go and, you know, do things and talk to people. And, yeah. uh, and he was always happy to do it. He, from a very young age, he would just go and talk to anybody. He was stoned a lot of the time, though. As an adult, yeah, he um, he got into pot early on, and that was his drug of choice. He was a kind of an original, you know, '70s style pothead, and mm-hmm. uh, and didn't drink for you know years and years. He just felt that that was unhip, and you know, pot was the way to go. Yeah, you mentioned that he was always laughing, and that uh, again, but. Reading the book, it, it, you, it seems like you had a, a pretty idyllic childhood. Your dad was an architect. Your mom was caring. You uh, were shaped, quote, shaped by our houses. Yeah, because, you know, the first house that we had, it was in this enclave called Wildwood Park, which was, in fact, um, this kind of... In Winnipeg. In Winnipeg. Yeah. And it was this utopian design that had been done by a couple of uh, architects in Jersey, and it was replicated in about a dozen places around the world, in Japan and Irvine, California. But it was designed so that kids wouldn't have to cross a road to do anything, basically. You, you'd you go to school, you'd get to a store, you could visit all your neighbors, and you wouldn't have any vehicular traffic to negotiate. And so with this massive park space, and plus we were actually on the river, so we had all this wild you know, forest between us and the river. And it was, you know, it's like being Huckleberry Finn, basically. Yeah, it was also uh, the, kind of the golden age of uh, the middle class. Uh, uh, well, and it doesn't sound to me like you were middle class. You had a milkman, you had a, you had a doctor that, uh, that made house calls. Yeah. It, it was a year's income for your dad to, to pay for the house. Whereas That's right. Now, look how many it is. Yeah, yeah. No, I think... It's optimistic times. Yeah, it was. And I... Um, you know, we, it was a kind of golden era, f- at least for the, for the middle class, for the white male middle class, at least. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we were kind of in the thick of that. And so, of course, you never know you're in, in a golden age when it's happening. It's only in retrospect. You see it as a yeah. golden age. Yeah, you don't know anything different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, seen, he, mar- he had a beautiful girlfriend that he married quite early and he had a daughter. Yes. Yeah. Um, who's just had twins, in fact. Oh. Hmm. But the marriage didn't last? No, and he, uh, you know, he wasn't really well designed for marriage, I think. Yeah, uh, and, uh, and and because of that, you know, the night world, he was out playing at night and, you know, he'd get up late and, um, and you know, women would come up to him after a show. And so I think it was, it's something he wasn't well equipped for. Well, who... Who can? It's yeah. very difficult to refuse that too. Though. Yeah. I mean, he just had the opportunity that many may not have had. Yeah, it's true. You say he loved his family but lived for music. Yeah, he was so immersed in music in in all kinds of ways. I mean, he certainly, you know, he played a bunch of different instruments, and he was just, and he kind of collected them. So he was actually physically surrounded by dozens of instruments and um, and he had a massive collection of CDs and vinyl and um, and he knew a lot about music and he was very eclectic in his taste you know so there was everything from bluegrass to classical and uh, it really was like a fundamental piece of him yeah I love the fact that you moved out to uh, 
uh, to Calgary where your father proceeded to build another beautiful house, but you got caught up in, in skiing and he got into bluegrass. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And that was another house that, you know, I, I think sort of defined us because it was my, it was the house that my father had always wanted to design for himself, but you, you know, you couldn't really do it in the city. You'd have building codes and things and you could build this place out in the country mm -hmm. that was exactly what he wanted. And it, the uniqueness of that place, I think, I mean, this was Frank Lloyd Wright's idea that you could kind of shape how people live by architecture and to yeah. some degree, my father was a big fan of Wright and to some degree that house sort of reflected that, that this was this kind of uh, unique place and it had this sort of glorious communal areas and these little tiny bedrooms just as Wright did in most of his houses. And, yeah, you, and, you talk about falling water. And yeah, yeah. One thing I was struck by when I went there was how low the, the ceilings were. He, I yeah. Mean, Right was a tiny little guy. That's right. He, yeah, yeah. And I guess he, he um, and because of that ego, I guess maybe he didn't feel he needed to make them any higher than right. for himself. That's right. Even though he built it for someone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing I thought was interesting, you you ponder what your brother may have thought about his upbringing, looking back. Yeah, and I, you know, because I... Uh, always look back and thought this is this sort of idyllic childhood and I have nothing but kind of fond memories and even of all the mishaps and things um, of which there were many. But it, it, it does, it is a, from an objective standpoint, I mean what an amazing life you had with the, with these wonderful houses too. I mean. Yeah and I, and I don't know that he shared that perspective, I think he did to some extent but I'm sure there was mm -hmm. a point where it, his perspective you know veered off from mine. He was the black sheep and blonde, actually. But yeah, I—I I mean, he was—he was genuinely the black sheep in every kind of respect, and you know, behaviorally certainly. But you know, he even—he looked different, and um, you know, everyone else steered towards academics, and and he wasn't, and 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 I think he inhabited that territory deliberately for a long time, and I think at some point it became uh, isolating. You then moved to Toronto, and as we were saying, he moved up to Whitehorse. Re uh, your relationship was defined by distance. You only saw each other every couple, couple of years at, at most, of, over like a 20, 25 year period. Yeah, yeah. So we, were you, you weren't really, you, it's difficult to be close to someone that you don't see very often. Yeah, it is. And, um, you know, I think as adults, we, we ended up having more in common and maybe it's just the fact that you're you know you're in your 40s and there's you're going through some of the same things but we were certainly more compatible in our you know in our 40s than we were when we were 10 and 12 yeah. so we'd come together quickly i think but it's true there was long spells right i wouldn't see him and then he walked at age 48. Now, again, he'd, he'd done a lot of, a lot of hard living uh, between the, when he was young and, and when he died. But uh, it seems like he didn't want to let go of his childhood or yeah. adolescence. Yeah, I think that's very true. And, I, you know, when I spoke to some of his former bandmates and guys that actually had been in the band in Calgary, so when he would have been, you know, early 20s, yeah. and... Um, they mentioned that you know as soon as it wasn't fun he didn't want to do it that was this sort of and took the easy way out yeah and he you know he really enjoyed all the things he did and then as soon as it got difficult i don't think he had uh it's less you know not having coping mechanisms as just not having the interest in dealing with it that the things had been great for so long mm -hmm. and uh you know one of his ex-bandmates who'd had you know who's now in his 60s and it's, he's, you know, he's had cancer and a few other health scares and all the things you have as you get older. And he remarked that he thought that David wouldn't want uh, to have dealt with any of this stuff. This is yeah. the kind of thing he wanted to avoid, in fact. Did you love him? Oh, yeah. And so he walked into the river at age 48 but you just got the word that he disappeared, that he went missing. Yeah, and that was a problem because we, you know, his truck had been spotted on the side of the road by the river uh, out of town. And uh, and then someone phoned the RCMP when it was still sitting there three days later. So we got a call saying he's missing. And 
you know, we've got the circumstances. And so initially we thought, well, he's just disappeared. We didn't think he was in a happy marriage. We thought maybe he's just lit out, you know. But then, you know, a week goes by and 10 days goes by. And then we're starting to kind of reassess, I guess, the, you know, me and the rest of the family. And my feeling was, and I think the feeling of my sister and parents as well, was mm. if, you know, he would, if he was out there somewhere, that at Christmas time he would phone my mother at least, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so when Christmas... considered Chris, enough to do that. Yeah, and I, and I think when Christmas passed, I think that was sort of the cutoff when I think we all began to uh, embrace the idea or try and embrace the idea that he had taken his life. Even though, you know, I was phoning people who were, who were friends of his up there in Whitehorse mm -hmm. and, you know, people would say, oh yeah, he's in, he's living in Alaska or he, he's in Vancouver with this woman he met or he's in Mexico. And But there was no, no one had any hard evidence about anything. And so we I think very quietly sort of gravitated towards this idea of suicide. Yeah, you, you went up there just, uh, I guess, to try and recreate what had happened. And this is beautiful, I think. Uh, you talk about the grim lacuna between rumor and information. And I can relate to that. Uh, as I mentioned before we started, my brother as far as I know, committed suicide. But one of the first things that I heard about it was a media report that he'd been murdered. So, and then you talk about a daisy chain of anecdote and disbelief. Yeah, that's beautifully written. Yeah, and I, you know, you try and assemble what had happened, but I'm sure you, I mean, you must have done the same thing with your own brother where you get news of something and you don't know how reliable this is and how did you in fact find out then the police came to the door in in uh, Canada uh -huh. and informed me and then I started searching on the internet and I found a news report that was the second thing I, I did. but it was a murder report uh, it was a yeah. report that he'd been murdered oh. in, in South Africa on Table Mountain Oh, and then how did you decide that it had been a suicide? Well, did a similar thing to what you did. I talked to a lot of people, and uh, mm -hmm. I, we went down there and uh, met with the police, and uh, they they told me they were convinced that uh, that it was a suicide, mm -hmm. and that uh, yeah. there was a suicide note, and. Uh, so I've come to some sort of resolution, but you know, the only other alternative is someone forged or made him write that suicide note. Right. And so I could go down that path, but yeah. Anyway, yeah. And I think you know that. I mean, that was one of the other theories was was my brother David, which is that he'd gotten in trouble with some you know local thugs, and that they had taken him out there and um, and there was no note and so the, that kind of bolstered that idea but when you're dealing with these things I think the, and the way the police look at them is the, the what it looks like is probably what it is is their kind of modus operandi and I, yeah. I think in the case of my brother that was the most logical based on what we the information we had it's what it's what made the most sense yeah you know? uh, and I think that's the same with me it's yeah. just uh even though it's interesting, you know, you talk about suicide being irrational, we're trying to grab onto the most rational explanation. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I found that that, uh, that life became surreal for me, the fact that he is just gone. And uh, it's, it's, it's a bit like a dream. He was like a dream. It's, it's, it's quite uh, unnerving. And would you, I mean, he was in South Africa, so did you see him much in adult life? I did. Oh, I saw you did? Him a lot. Oh, yeah. Okay. We saw him each other every year pretty well. Oh, okay. Oh. Either I went over there or he traveled around the world and we met up or, yeah. or he came here. Yeah. Um, he, your brother David, you mentioned that he did have trouble with women and drinking and, and infidelity and addictions. 
and it seemed like nothing was ever enough. Does that explain why he killed himself or not? I don't think it explains, but it's true that there, you know he just needed whatever it was he had. He needed more, and um, I think you know as long as that there was a sort of continuum where you know he's out playing music and. Um, he's usually in a stable relationship or almost always in some sort of relationship but then you know having these affairs on the side yeah. and he's able to you know smoke pot while he's working basically yeah. and um, so you know that's sort of a sustaining world for him and then what happened to you know is that that did come to the end he's in a relationship with a woman who you know wants him to uh, quit everything which yeah. is a, you know a good thing um, but he also um, decided to get a full-time job, and he was got this job as a manager at the uh, Chapters bookstore that was coming to Whitehorse, and um, which is you know a, a good job. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, for him, it's it was like going into the straight world. You know, it was like going back to kind of the 1969 mm -hmm. dichotomy of now he's the man, and you know he'd been this living this sort of charmed kind of uh you know bohemian life and now he's going to be getting up at eight in the morning and going to work like everybody else and i think and that being responsible and, and having to answer you know questions and yeah, yeah and all you know and 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 coming home and having dinner with his wife and i think that whole world had very little appeal to him and i don't say that this was the reason but i in thinking all, all these things kind of adding up and presenting some kind of a bill it's interesting right. how you paint uh, white uh, white horse. You, uh, you say that it's, and I, I love this. You say it's full of sturdy legged <laughs> bureaucrats. Uh, how's a bureaucrat sturdy legged? Well, this is my uh, this is a broad generalization. I have to say, for it to be <laughs> fair to all the people of White Horse, but there is a lot of hiking to do around there, so that may okay. lend itself to sturdy legs. But you know, there is a sort of bureaucratic. I don't know if look is the right word, but yeah, I had that mood there. <laughs> yes. This is this was painful too, and I can relate to it. He walked into the river and was found quite a long ways down away from where he walked in. And you chose not to see the body because I think the coroner or someone said you won't be able to get the image out of your mind and you can't unsee it. Yeah, and I, you know, I was talking to her on the phone because I said, well, I'll come in and, you know, just make a identification, even though he had been, you know, definitively um, identified. But, and I hadn't even thought of this, but she said, you know, he has been in the river for six months and he's he's been carried down stream along the bed of the river. Yeah. And um, you may not want to see this. And... I thought about it a lot because I had a day to think about it and I thought, you know, she's got a point, she's right, I won't be able to unsee it, it'll stay in my mind forever, I'll never get it out of my head. Yeah, that's exactly the thinking process I went through too. Oh, is that right? Exactly, yeah. And did you in fact go and see it? No, yeah. no. I could have seen it, it was in the next room, but I chose not to. Yeah, yeah, and I chose not to, but then, you know, as I say, I there's a regret when I took off like once I'm safely in the plane and can't in fact see him yeah yeah then I had this stab of regret that that somehow I owed him this and it was it wasn't a kind of linear equation but it, it just felt like I had somehow there was an obligation that I hadn't fulfilled somehow and despite the fact that it would be painful and lasting um, so it's it's something that I've never settled in my mind you know I'm in, in a way she, she was probably right and I was probably right not to go and look at him but I still feel that it's uh, something uh, unsettled you know mm, yeah you uh, went on a, a trip a new trip while you were up there and uh, this is quite uh, haunting you say the thought that David had moved beneath me six months earlier nudged along by the current wouldn't leave mm -hmm. yeah and I at this point his body actually hadn't uh, or when I, at the point I rented the canoe his body hadn't surfaced and I'd actually rented the canoe with the idea you know maybe I'll actually see him it's a, so unlikely but you never know and, and then by the time I actually went in the canoe trip 
his body had surfaced. So I was kind of recreating that voyage downstream, but it was uh, disturbing. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, speaking of resolution, uh, the fact that he was happy in these last days or last weeks, uh, you say here on page 111, but as they begin to feel better, they are suddenly capable of killing themselves. And some of them do. They seem happier to others because the end is in sight, the new sunniness which friends and family interpret as an end to a long, difficult depression is actually resolution. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's the case with uh, a lot of people, but there's also some, sometimes, like there was, um, you know, the people that jump off the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, which is a real magnet for suicides, mm. yeah. um, roughly one in 50 survives that fall, and there's a testimonial from a guy who, um, you know, stepped over the bridge, and then he hung on by his hands, like he kind of lowered himself down, he was hanging on by his hands, and then he said while he was, hanging there he thought everything that i uh, am you know trying to get away from is a temporary problem and i can solve every problem in my life except for the fact that i can't hang on to this bridge any longer so he let go and he was one of the people who survived but that idea of you know in his case and and and, you know in many cases where you're overcome or overwhelmed by despair but you know, you wonder how many of those people at the, at this very last second think, you know, I could take out a loan, I could change jobs, I could divorce my wife, you know. Yeah. There are solutions to almost every practical issue that you have. Um, and that, that too, I wonder, you know, what flashes through is this the whole, all this stuff, you know, flying through your head in that last minute. Yeah, and I think you, a couple of pages on, you quote Gustave Le Bon, who says, uh, many men can easily do without truth, but none is strong enough to do without uh, illusion. In one of its guises, suicide is the abandoning of all illusion, that we will become fitter and happier, that we will get out of debt, find love, uh, wake up to find that darkness has lifted and the sun is shining. Yeah, and I, you know, it's the inability to do that. Yeah, and I think you know, I I mentioned uh, before earlier to you that uh, another friend had since taken his life since the book came out in mm. this summer, and he was a guitar, a jazz guitarist, a musician as well, and uh, he uh, took his life in Thailand, but he sent a uh, audio file to his sister that was a suicide note saying, "I'm going to kill myself." you know, on Thursday, and um, mm. and he said he had some um, debilitating condition where his hands were essentially turning into kind of arthritic claws. He couldn't play professionally anymore and, and could hardly even play recreationally. And uh, he was in you know, mid-60s, and he just said, you know, and it was very dispassionate. He had this very kind of philosophical tone mm. just saying, I've had a really good life. It's been more interesting than most lives, but I've come to the end of something and I can't see getting enough enjoyment out of this this last phase, especially having, you know, my livelihood and my passion have both been sort of yanked away. And then he took his life a few days later. And I think there is, there are those people where there is a kind of logic and it's, yeah. It's, it doesn't have to be well. Um, it's tragic for people around him, but for him, he was in control. He did what he wanted to do. Yeah, and and because you know he's had a full life. He's sixty six. Um, there's a different perspective because there is a kind of there's some sort of there's a rational uh, there's some rational reasons there, and I think that you know the tragedy is younger and preventable suicides where yeah, you know yeah. that that's where it really and it and it leaves such devastation exactly yeah yeah it's the people who have to keep living yeah this was very painful a very painful detail i i thought uh, you included that the police took him out of the river with a grappling hook yeah um which I wouldn't have known, but it, because I, when I was canoeing, I ended up 
the pickup spot was on the river at this uh, uh, guy who had a uh, float plane and um, he was the one who took me down because the body had come out you know about 40 feet down river from his shack and he showed me and then you know mentioned that they'd taken him out with the grappling hook and yeah it's um it, it's uh, it kind of a little impersonal and i mean there's you know there's probably no other way of getting you out yeah. but there you yeah. go yeah you mention uh and i i assume it's not his uh his real name but i was very intrigued to to know uh, who who it who it is, uh, an arch reporter by the name of Stephen, because he sounds really fun and interesting. He took you to a play, and then he leaned over about twenty minutes in and said, <laughs> "I owe you." And even later on, he said, "I'll do, I'll do your yeah, taxes." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it was one of these sort of. Um, uh, almost uh, like a comically bad play. It was a, a experimental German play that was yes. kind of hilariously bad. And uh, but um, this is you're not going to divulge his real name then. I assume. That is his first name. Uh, okay. But yeah, I don't know that the family wants the, yeah. the, the okay. second name. But yeah, um, yeah, he was like a lovely, fun guy. And again, yeah. and I, uh, you know, I didn't know him as well as others. And I've talked to you know mutual friends since then, who also you know had no idea. And he was at a, at a, you know, by all accounts, was in a sort of good spot in his life. He's got a great job. He's yeah. got a wife, yeah. um, terrific wife, who was expecting. And um, and then, you know, for whatever reason, he suddenly vanishes from our lives. Yeah. Just one other line that he delivered was, uh, you played tennis together. He said, you have a tennis game of a, a low percentage serial killer. <laughs> That's true. And, it, it, and, and I still have that same game. But um, yeah, we actually, we, so we were kind of a perfect match because he was this sort of upper class guy who'd obviously grown up with tennis lessons, but he wasn't a very athletic guy. Yeah. So we kind of were a perfect match in many ways. Mm -hmm. You, in the book, you, and the book is uh, To the River, published by Random House and I'm speaking with Don Gilmore, you do a bit of delving into various uh, studies and, and you know, attend different conferences and such. And uh, I think the end of one of the conferences, the keynote speaker says that the meaning of suicide is elusive, which makes preventing it so difficult. Yeah, and I think, you know, all this, I mean, there's lots of research and there's conferences and support groups and everything, and all this is, is good and necessary. But I think, you know, we still end up with this um, uh, mysterious question of why that in some cases is clear, but in many cases it isn't. And, um, you know, we can look at all kinds of factors and, you know, depression's often a factor, but all those sort of quantitative things that sociologists talk about. I mean, if you're divorced, you have a greater chance and um, if you don't have a college degree and they, but these are all kind of quantitative analyses that uh, in the end aren't that helpful. It just tells you that, you know, if you live in Northern Norway, you have a higher percentage chance than if you live in Costa Rica, but mm -hmm. it doesn't help us, you know, really in terms of moving forward with what's going on. And it is, uh, you refer to it as an epidemic, but in particularly our age uh, cohort. Yeah, and the, and the th interesting thing is that that used to be the safe zone, you know, kind of 40 to 60 was this sort of comfort zone. And the two high risk areas were, you know, youth and, and genuine old age. And the fact that that inverted with our generation, I think, is the big surprise. And the fact that we seem to be isolated because the people coming after us also are having lower rates and at that time mm -hmm. and so in terms of the sociological literature there's talk of you know the boomers were entitled which you know we were our expectations and were what higher that's right met, yes exactly we had these high expectations and they weren't met and you know we didn't have the kind of coping mechanisms that you know people who dealt with world war ii or the depression or you know in previous generations did mm -hmm. and then you know, because we were the ones that tore down all those institutions, basically, so that the people coming after us, we were the ones who kind of the divorce rate mushroomed with, with our generation. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, the people following us, 
you know, half the kids grow up in a house where the parents are separated. So it's not, it's not a big deal anymore, no, no. you know, and no stigma. Yeah. And uh, so I think, you know, it could be that we sort of paid the a price for for some of that, some of that change, much of which was good, some not so good, but you know, there you go. Yeah, the armchair mm -hmm. uh, psychiatrist in me, or psychologist, wants to say that it's about love, and it's about mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe not being able to find love or having lost love or finding oneself unlovable often love plays a role yeah and and it's uh i mean i guess wrapped up in that isolation you know in terms of men especially you know as we get older mm -hmm. i think we're less adept than women at kind of keeping these bonds, you know, a friendship, and, yeah. yeah, yeah, and you know, I mean, I notice it even when I when I'm teaching, uh, you see, you know, in these classes that have I have like twelve women and four guys in a class, and um, during the break, you know, the women they bond almost instantly. They're talking and they're exchanging all kinds of you know intimate details about things, and the four guys are kind of you know, looking at their phones and, uh, yeah. uh, and it's a, you know, it's a generalization, but you do see this in the wider population that we end up more isolated as we're older. And I think that's a real dangerous thing. And, you know, as you say, it's, um, you know, lo looking for life, it's a, you know, it's a lifelong thing. And if you lose it and then are unable or incapable of finding it again, it's, yeah, or it, it, anyway. yeah that, that there's a hole there that is, you know, it's hopeless. Yeah, yeah, too deep to fill. Yeah. And yet, on the flip side, you know, the biological level, it seems that mm. uh, we, when you're healthy, at least, it's like you, you crave life. Well, yeah, hopefully. Um, and um, you know, I mean, at that at that biological level, certainly there, there is something, you know, undermining our. Uh, our own dark thoughts that you do see bodies are designed to, to stay alive yeah you know it's difficult and, yeah to kill yeah, yourself yeah and uh, but you know with enough kind of determination we sort of override those you know that basic biological impulse yeah the uh, this is sort of William Blakey in here this is another this is a guy called Lester who was wrapping up a talk that you were attending. Oh, yes. Yeah. And uh, you're quoting him as saying, perhaps nothing special happens, but one more grain of sand added to the pile results in the pile collapsing, and then we hold that grain of sand responsible for the collapse. Yeah, and I thought that was a really interesting quote. He was... Um, oh, this guy was the keynote speaker at a, a conference, I was suicide conference I went to, and mm -hmm. he was brought on uh, as the kind of preeminent suicidologist. He'd written these 2,500 papers and a, you know, 99 books, I think it is, and so, and he was just on the verge of retirement. And he, um, when they brought him on, it was almost like this sort of Vegas welcome. It was this <laughs> the big lead up, and then let's bring on with a big hand, Mister Suicidology, and so he made that remark which I thought was really interesting because I th I suspect that's true in that you know that's a guy's wife divorces him and then he takes his life and we say well that you know that's what caused it you know he the divorce killed him but you know there could be a dozen underlying preconditions that we don't know about maybe yeah. he had suffered from depression maybe there you know all kinds of things and i think there is complicating factors that's yeah. right yeah. It, yeah and i think it's the need or not the need but the desire to simplify and have one simple answer and we, you know we kind of crave that and so if it's presented to us then we'll grab it but i think in most of these cases it's as he says there's a series of factors some of them we don't know and can't know and some of them we could probably find out if we had enough detail on this guy's life, you know. Yeah. You uh, finish off the book, or close to it anyway, with a quote from uh, John Russon, 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 a, f a philosophy prof professor oh. at Guelph. And I love this. He uses a music, uh, musical analogy to, and he's talking about boredom. 
in order to experience music, to hear a melody, we have to be able to retain the notes that came before whatever note we are hearing. All our experiences, he wrote, carry on something like this melodic, harmonic, and rhythmic flow, whereby one moment seems to grow out of the last and melt into the next in a way that keeps the tune going. But people who are suicidal don't necessarily hear a melody, just the isolated note, without the context of the notes that came before and the anticipation of the notes to come. That note is tuneless, devoid of joy or meaning. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, um, in the case of people like uh, I mean, David Foster Wallace and other Jonathan Franzen wrote an essay yeah, about yeah. Wallace and you yeah. know you got that sense that there was a, a kind of boredom that had set in and the fact that his last novel was it's all about, about boredom, boredom yeah. you know it's it, you, yeah. you, it, who the hell wants to read a novel about being bored yeah or the I think the novel is intentionally trying to make the reader bored yeah and <laughs> you know it's I mean he, he proved his point, I guess. He but, sure um, did. How far did you get? Uh, I got. I oh, I didn't get to page one hundred. Yeah. yeah, I got a quarter of the way through. So. Oh well, yeah. yeah. And you know, this is the phenomenon where you you know I admire him as a writer greatly, mm -hmm. but I didn't get through Infinite Jest either. I thought it was a terrific book, but I didn't get to the end mm -hmm. um, because it just got. I, I did get bored, and um, there you have it. But that kind of you know profound existential boredom, I think afflict certain people and it and you can see it in you know if you if you're visiting uh you know elderly people sometimes you're going to a you know assisted living or a final care place and you see these people and you know that they're sitting in that same moment for mm -hmm. hours sometimes yeah. you know and um and that's all that's, that's gonna vegetative be. Almost. Yeah, yeah yeah and uh so there's a kind of it's a boredom that's you know profound and inescapable I guess in some cases yeah maybe your brother uh, felt a certain boredom but he he found excitement in music and that was a real great way to get rid of the boredom I think so and I think the yeah, drugs too of course the but. drugs and I think you know maybe the drugs more so as he got older you know because you know I think I mentioned at some point where my father and he you know would my father's trying to steer him towards university and he said as an argument you know do you want to be sitting in a bar playing for a bunch of drunks when you're 40 years old and you know i think he in fact was playing for a bunch of drunks you know when he was 40 years old and uh, i think some of the excitement and fun of that was wearing off you know and i think that's why i i just feel if he had explored that gift further you know in terms of um, you know, taking even taking piano lessons later because he he quit relatively early because he could, you know, just pick things up on his own. He didn't need any more instruction. Yeah. But uh, had he gone farther, I think it would have been a benefit to him to gone deeper into some of these things. You know, um, but as his friend said, you know, as soon as it got hard, he wasn't interested. So he had this gift that. Uh, was kind of effortless and enviable. Yeah. Quick study. Um, and, uh, yeah, and um, so it took him, you know, a, a ways, a long ways. Yeah. Um, I mean, as my mother said, he, he sort of packed 75 years of living into 48 years, and I think that's true. Um, and he just, yeah, wasn't interested in the, the last third. It was going to be too boring. Yeah, I think so. With your brother, though, did you have any sense of anything? Did you have any warning, any sense this was sort of going on in his head? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Yeah. And none of his friends either. Yeah. No one saw it coming. It was the weirdest thing. That's why it's so tempting to try and build a case for foul play. Right. But, uh, but I, as I say, I. I don't. I, I'm pretty well resolved that it wasn't. But uh, yeah, that's the thing. We we will never know. Did that note make sense to you? It did. I tried to say, suggest that it, his signature didn't look like his own signature, but I think the writing was was close. Yeah, close enough. So, uh, 
but as I say, I think that's the thing that you know, being curious human beings, we want to know, yeah, and we can't know, and that's that's a bit like life itself. We want to know what's going to happen after we die. Yeah, we just yeah. <laughs> we're not going to know that. No, no, it's true. We crave resolution. Well, thank you very much for writing the book. It was. Uh, it was, a, it was a very good experience to read it, and uh, I appreciate it. Well, thank you for your interest and for the interview. I've been speaking with Don uh, Gilmore, and the book is the, now is that 2019? It is. The 2019 Governor General's award-winning nonfiction book, To the River, Losing My Brother, published by Random House Canada. Thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you, Nine